Okay, 8 a.m. and let's start. <clears throat> so in the previous lecture, we introduced the method of an equivalent resistance, which uh, can be used only in special cases when resistors are connected either in series or in parallel, right? But of course, you know, there are tons of situations uh, where uh, resistors are not connected in that way. And of course, uh, applying the method of an equivalent resistors uh, would be illegal, right? From the mathematical point of view, from the, physic for, from the point of view of physics, right? And in order to handle uh, those situations, we need to come up with some rules which are um, more universal, more general, right? And uh, Kirchhoff rules, that's what Kirchhoff rules do for us, right? So we can apply them uh, pretty much anywhere we want without any restrictions, right? So the main goal of today's class is to introduce Kirchhoff rules. And also, a uh, method of an equivalent <coughs> resistance, examples, examples, we practiced in our recitation classes, right? And since uh, it's very similar to the method of an equivalent capacitance, so I'm not going to uh, look at another example in the lecture, right? Uh, I just posted another example in my previous lecture slides, right? You can uh, easily look at, uh, look at that example by yourself. Right? Okay, so, but anyway, back to uh, the lecture. So the main goal is to introduce Kirchhoff rules. But, but before we start doing this, we need to dive uh, into a battery and uh, to improve sort of our model uh, of a battery, right? You remember we discussed uh, how battery works, but now maybe we can add something new, right? In order to make our model more realistic, right? Okay, so real battery, of course, uh, as close as we can uh, go to uh, real batteries. Right, uh, so let's uh, use a gravitational analog of a battery in order to understand which part uh, is still missing in our uh, way of describing the work of a battery. So let's assume that we have this, uh, yeah, as I said, gravitational analog, which consists basically of two slopes, you see, this one, and then there is a hole and of course there is a second one. And let's drop a few soccer balls. I'm from Europe, I like soccer a lot, right? So I'm dropping soccer balls, All right? And if, you, if we drop a few of them, right? Uh, then maybe in a few seconds, within two, three seconds, of course the current of these balls will definitely disappear, right? And in order to maintain kind of, uh, in order to keep or maintain the uh, current of these balls, of course, we need to add uh, some kind of a device. And the goal of that device would be to move these balls from the bottom, from here to the top. I couldn't come up with anything better than uh, this guy, <clears throat> right? Since, uh, and he's wearing the Brazilian colors, he's Bra Brazilian, uh, the... Uh, the craziest about soccer, right? So that's why I, I use this color, right? So his goal is to grab the ball at the bottom and move it up to the top, all right? And so now in this case, of course, we can have uh, the uh, current of uh, these uh, soccer balls, right? But, but, of course, uh, this guy cannot move these balls instantaneously, right? with zero period of time. Of course, it takes time to grab the ball, to lift it, and then, to and then uh, drop it uh, at the bottom, uh, I mean, at the top, right? So it takes time, right? And of course, if you, uh, if you increase, for example, number of balls, right, on this, um, in, in this circuit, of course, at some point, uh, he wouldn't be able to keep, keep up, right? So there will be some kind of a bottleneck effect here uh, um, where the guy is, right? So he, he would start bringing some natural resistance uh, to otherwise a free flow of balls. Because again, he just uh, naturally cannot move. It takes time uh, for him to uh, move these balls, right? So naturally he brings some uh, resistance to otherwise a completely free flow of balls. And something similar happens in the battery. Because what happens in the battery? In a battery, um, it charges uh, moved from one electrode, electrode to the other one. And of course, it doesn't happen instantaneously. 
It takes time. So the process is somewhat similar to this one, right? So again, a uh, battery by itself is going to bring some natural uh, hindrance uh, to otherwise a completely free flow of uh, electrons, right? And of course, that process in the battery is quite complicated if you try to describe it to all the details, right? And, but in physics, you know, very often researchers uh, try to bypass all those complicated questions, all those complicated processes, right? In this case, Researchers just said, okay, let's, you know what, let's just introduce what is called the internal resistance. And we can measure it experimentally usually, right? Internal resistance. As a result, all those tricky questions, all those complicated models, which can be, which can, which you can create to describe that um, uh, natural resistance will be bypassed, right? So, and, um, and we don't have to, yeah, um, struggle as much. We can just measure uh, internal resistance experimentally, right? And all those tricky questions will be yeah, covered, right? It's sort of like I told you, uh, if we, uh, what, if about a month ago, right? So if we have those questions, right? So we can sweep them under the rug, but the rug must be nice Persian, right? So that no one would even dare to lift it up and uh, bring those questions up, right? So the same situation is here. So. That's basically the logic behind uh, the idea of introducing the internal resistance of the battery, right? And so now, uh, we, if we introduce this internal resistance, then of course uh, the battery will consist of two parts. Consist of two parts. Sort of like a, an ideal battery, part of the battery, which uh, creates the potential difference. And then internal resistance. And that ideal part of the battery without internal resistance uh, and no potential difference across that ideal part of the battery is called EMF, electromotive force. Don't even try to think what does it mean this name. It means nothing, right? Literally nothing. Because back then, what, uh, 200, 300 years ago, yeah, of course, the researchers um, try to come up with some model what happens inside of the battery, right? And according to that model, uh, this uh, term made sense. But of course, all that mod model turned out to be completely wrong. It was trashed, right, by the history of physics. But the term somehow managed to survive. Maybe because it sounds cool. But of course, you know, we all like school names. So like automotive force, it sounds cool. Right. But again, so my point is, don't try to see any meaning in this term. There, are no, there is no any meaning. It's just a, a potential difference uh, across an ideal battery, right? EMF. And, and uh, since, you're going to, since you use mastering physics, right? And of course, you're going to use EMFs a lot. So in order to get the correct symbol, again, go to the Greek uh, box, right? G box of Greek letters. Uh, and at the end, of the uh, that alphabet, there is a capital EMF, right? And if you put a cursor on top of that, it will show you EMF. So use that. Don't use small epsilon because in that case, of course, mastering physics will tell you that your answer is wrong. Okay, so now we introduced EMF, and now, uh, as I said, so battery uh, consists of two parts, right? So you see, ideal part, which um, ideal battery, which gives us which increases potential, right, electric potential, EMF. And then uh, there is, of course, some uh, internal resistance, which is going to give us uh, some voltage drop. So now, if you, for example, take a voltmeter and try to measure the potential difference across the battery, you're not going to measure EMF, right? So if you attach here uh, electrode of your voltmeter and here electrode, right, so you're going to measure EMF, minus voltage drop across this internal resistance. Since there is a current I flowing, right, let's assume the battery is connected to some load, right, as a result what you measure is EMF minus IR, which is the voltage drop across that internal resistance, right. And this potential difference is called the terminal voltage, right, <laughs> sounds cool. 
Um, and of course, uh, you understand that this internal resistance is inseparable from the ba from the battery. It's impossible to separate it, right? <clears throat> physically, physically, of course, right? But of course, on a diagram, quite often uh, we can treat this internal resistor as well, as an additional resistor in a circuit. Right? Okay, then of course, on uh, the natural question, so how can we measure this EMF, right? And the trick is quite simple: uh, disconnect a load from your battery. So let's let uh, just uh, take the battery by itself, right? And in this case, of course, a current will be zero. And then uh, take a voltmeter, touch the electrodes of the battery. Of course, voltmeter will draw current, but that current will be very, very, very small, right? So that's how voltmeters are designed, right? So it will draw the current. As a result, this voltage drop across an internal resistor will be very, very small. As a result, your uh, terminal voltage, which you're going to measure, will be very close to the uh, EMF uh, of the battery. Right? Just disconnect the load and use the voltmeter uh, to measure the potential difference across the uh, electrodes of the battery. In this case, potential, I mean, EMF will be very, very close to the terminal voltage. Okay, so the goal why I decided to introduce this uh, before I started discussing Kirchhoff rules, because I needed this EMF, I needed to introduce this electromotive force or uh, potential difference of an ideal battery. So from now on, uh, we're going to use it a lot. Right. Okay, so now uh, we... Uh, made a um, model of a better slightly more complicated right or more realistic okay so now uh kirchhoff rules right okay all right uh as i said now uh they are almost like universal there are no any restrictions you can apply them for any circuit and you know what uh kirchhoff managed to write them when he was a graduate student usually uh, the biggest achievement uh, people made, okay, researcher, when they already graduate from school, right? Uh, but uh, as for me, he's uh, mostly known for these rules. And he uh, presented them while he was a graduate student, right? Kind of interesting. Okay, so, and of course, we're going to use these rules uh, to analyze uh, circuits mostly full of resistors. And again, what does it mean analyzing a uh, circuit? full of resistors. We need to know potential difference across each of those resistors and we need to know the current flowing through uh, each of those resistors. Usually resistances are given. You remember again if you uh, play with resistors you need to analyze three parameters all the time. R, I, delta V. Usually when you build the circuit resistances are given. Wait, resistances are given, right? And as a result, the two parameters left. You need to discuss, uh, you need to find uh, potential differences and you need to find currents. That's what means, that's what analyzing um, a circuit uh, in this case uh, means. Okay, and now let me state. Um, ah, yeah, another thing I wanted to mention. Uh, usually books write, uh, present them as Kirchhoff laws. You see, I wrote rules. And let me justify that. Again, it's not a big deal, right? But for me, law, it's something yeah, fundamental, right? Uh, like, you know, Gauss's law, right? Uh, Newton's laws, right? Uh, but these Kirchhoff rules, of course, there are fundamental laws lying behind them. I will state those laws, right? And Kirchhoff just applied those fundamental laws in circuitry. Basically, what he did, it's just an application problem, application of fundamental stuff for, um, for a particular situation, right? So I would call it rules instead of law, right? But of course, which laws uh, lie behind these rules, I will tell you, right? So let's state uh, the rule number one, Kirchhoff junction rule. You already started using it, right? So if you have a junction point, for example, this one, right? Junction point where uh, wires um, get connected or get split, right? Then the total amount of current entering junction point 
must be equal to the total amount of current leaving junction point. And of course, what lies behind this uh, rule? Conservation of charge. Yes, fundamental law conservation of charge applied uh, in a circuitry. That's it. Right? Okay. Uh, and uh, so in this case here, yeah, so you see uh, current, what, I1 enters the junction point and then current I2 and I3 leaves this junction point. As a result, I can write that I1 equals I2 plus I3. So usually students don't have any troubles uh, applying this law, except sometimes they just forget to add this equation on the exam. If I give a problem about junctions rule, right. <clears throat> sometimes they just forget. Right. Okay, so that's, that's the rule number one, junction rule. Now let's uh, introduce the second one, uh, loop rule, which is slightly more complicated, right? So if you take any loop, any any loop your soul desires in a circuit and start from a certain point pick a direction travel direction every time you need to uh, go either clockwise or counterclockwise so which way you go it doesn't matter but every time you will have to pick a direction right and if you start walking a certain direction counting all the potential di potential differences across each of the elements in that loop when you get back to the initial point, and if you add up all those potential differences, you must end up with zero. That's the uh, loop rule, right? For example, let's say uh, we have this loop, right? And you see, I pick a direction, travel direction. Every time uh, when, we are, when we are going to apply this rule, we're going to pick a travel direction. And again, it doesn't matter which direction you pick clockwise, counterclockwise, it doesn't matter. It's not going to change the result, but you have to pick a certain direction. And of course, you have to start from a certain point, right? Counting, right? For example, let's start from this point, right? So if you start from this point, uh, then of course you will have to calculate this delta V1, then delta V2, delta V3, and delta V4. And once you get back to the initial point, if you add all those potential differences, you must end up with zero. The loop rule, Kirchhoff's loop rule. Of course, you can ask, so what's the uh, logic behind this rule? And there is a, as I said, there is a fundamental law behind each of these Kirchhoff's rules. In this case, it's a conservation of energy. Previous rule. Conservation of charge uh, lie, okay, lies behind that rule. In this case, uh, it's a conservation of energy. And let me justify it. Let, not justify, actually show it. Right. So, uh, let's, uh, okay, let's um, sort of like keep track of one electron, right? So current, it's a drift of, an, of electrons, right? Let's pick one electron over here and follow it. All right, as it moves around this loop. So when it gets back, right? So this is the initial point and this will be also fi final point, right? Because it's a uh, closed loop. And uh, let's apply uh, conservation of mechanical energy of an electron. And let me apply it in this way. Delta K equals minus two delta, minus delta U. U is a potential energy. Usually up to this point, every time I applied conservation of mechanical energy in this way, K initial plus U initial equals to K final plus U final. But if you move uh, all kinetic energies to one side of the equation, potential energies to other side of the equation, you will get K final minus Q initial equals to minus U final minus U initial. Basically this, delta K equals to uh, equals to minus delta U. I know some of you prefer to use conservation of mechanical energy in this way. Okay, so I use this form, right? which is basically potato, potato, right? basically the same. Okay, so then every time we consider a steady current, it means what? It means that uh, average speed of electrons as they drift through the loop is the same, constant. Average speed of electrons is constant. So as a result, what can you say about delta K? It started, let's say, with I don't know, 5 meters per second, and it gets back to the final point with the same speed. So kinetic energy initial and kinetic energy final is going to be exactly the same. So delta K is zero.
right? So delta k is zero. As a result, we're getting that delta u must be equal to zero. So that's the next line. Delta u equals to zero. And now we just need to connect potential energy with the electric potential, which we've done uh, in the past. Because uh, potential energy equals to q times v, where v is the electric potential. You remember, right? And of course, now delta u we can write as q times delta v, where q is the charge of an electron constant, right? And it must be equal to zero. Of course, charge of an electron can be, can be removed because the product of this equals to zero and q is constant as a result delta v. And delta v, it's a total delta v because we discussed the motion of an electron over the whole loop. So delta v, it's a total delta v over the whole loop. Of course, this delta v consists of several parts. That's what we have, delta, a sum of delta v i's, right? So that's the proof uh, of this uh, loop rule. So conservation of mechanical energy, that's what uh, lies behind uh, this loop rule. Conservation of charge behind junction rule, conservation of mechanical energy lies behind loop rule. So you see Kirchhoff just applied fundamental stuff for a particular problem, for circuitry, right? which was very clever. And uh, as a result, because he applied fundamental laws, which you, of course you remember can be applied at any point of time, at any point of the universe, right? By anyone. So it means there are no restrictions on the, for these rules. You can grab, uh, you can apply them for any uh, part of the circuit, right? Okay, so now, of course, now next logical question. So you see, we're going to calculate all these delta Vs. And it's not that difficult, but it can be tedious, right? So it's better to develop some set of mnemonic rules, which can be used, which can be, which can be used in order to uh, speed up the process, in order to move faster, writing down necessary equations, right? Oh, in this case, uh, equa loop rule uh, equations, right? So pretty much now for the next couple of slides, we're going to set up uh, a set of rules, which can be used to uh, write, to find all these delta Vs and write a uh, loop uh, uh, rule equation, right? And we're going to introduce uh, two rules related to a battery, Right? And two rules related to a resistor, right? With junction rule, no troubles, right? It's just nothing to discuss. You just need to grab it and use it. But loop rule, since we're going to find every time all these delta Vs, so we need to spend time uh, discussing it, how that can be done, right? Okay, so now for the next couple of slides, we will just uh, develop those uh, four rules. Again, two for a battery, two uh, about resistors. Okay, so now uh, let's start with the battery because um, rules are easier. Right. Okay, so let's assume that uh, we have this battery. Of course, a negative electrode, positive electrode, right? You usually position the battery so you know which side is positive, which side is negative, right? And then as I told you every time, we will have to pick uh, a travel direction. Clockwise, counterclockwise, it doesn't matter, but you have to pick a certain direction and stick with that direction. Okay, so let's assume uh, that we pick a direction and in this situation, let's assume that direction is that one. This is uh, my chosen travel direction. Of course, the next rule will be about different direction. Okay, and, uh, but of course you can ask me, so what's the logic? Why are you forcing us uh, to choose this direction? What, what's so special about this direction? And here is why we need this direction. What are we trying to find? We're trying to find delta V. Delta V, of course, by definition, every time delta, it's the final value of the electric, okay, uh, the value of the electric potential at the final point minus value of the electric potential at the uh, initial point. V final minus V initial, that's what uh, delta V by definition is, right? How do we know which point is final and which point is initial? 
that's why we need a travel direction. Once you pick a travel direction, you know that when you move across this battery, this point is going to be, not is going to be, is your final point. And this point is your initial point. So you started from here and then when you cross, you end up there. So it's a final point. This is initial point. That's why we need a travel direction so that we would, we would, so that we will know which point is final and which point is initial because we need to calculate every time delta V in the loop rule. All right. Okay. So that's the logic. And, and now the next. Uh, so what about the electric potential? Which point is at higher electric potential? Which point is at a lower electric potential? <coughs> All right, into, uh, out of this a uh, final and initial. Of course, we know properties of the battery, right? We know that a uh, positively charged electrode, of course, is at higher potential, electric potential. And of course, negatively charged electrode is at lower electric potential, right? Because one of potential is positive, right? The other one, uh, the potential is negative, right? So just knowing uh, the properties of the battery, we can say that this final point is at higher potential and the, uh, the initial point at, uh, at the lower potential, electric potential, right? So now we can say that uh, this is V final. It's, uh, uh, it's connected to this final point is at higher potential. So I can write instead of this V final, V plus. And instead of V initial, right, V initial. I can write V minus because that point is at lower potential. So as a result, of course, a delta V is going to be positive. Delta V is going to be positive, right? And if we assume that this is an ideal battery, right? It means that if this battery has internal resistance, of course, we can treat it separately as a resistor, right? We can draw it separately in the circuit and treat it as an additional resistor. So this is, we assume, an ideal battery. And so what's the uh, potential difference across an ideal battery? Previous slides. Okay, the beginning of the lecture. EMF, right? That's why I needed EMF before I started discussing these Kirchhoff rules. So now this V plus uh, minus V initial, it's a plus EMF. It's a positive, right? And uh, um, uh, contribution to that equation, to the loop equation is plus EMF. So the first mnemonic rule, if you travel across the battery from minus to plus, contribution to that loop equation is plus EMF, right? Of course, if you don't want to uh, remember this rule, okay, you can analyze it every time if you want, right? Okay, so that's the rule number one. Now, rule number two, again, related to the battery. And of course, you understand what will be different, right? We will just change the uh, travel direction or flip the polarity of the battery. Let me flip the polarity of the battery, right, for the rule number two, right? So, you see, now we, th we have a plus and minus. Here we had minus and plus, here plus minus, and travel direction is the same. So, but now you see we travel from plus to minus. Here we travel from minus to plus, now from plus to minus. And of course, you should be able to guess immediately what will be the uh, contribution to the loop equation, all right? <laughs> but anyway, let's discuss. Of course, um, this is now uh, our final point. This is our initial point according to the travel direction. Again, according to the properties of the battery, this point, which is the final point, is at lower potential. Uh, initial point is at higher potential because we know it's a positive electrode, right? So as a result, V final minus V initial will be what? V minus minus V plus. And of course, uh, <clears throat> so contribution will be negative and we know the value of that contribution is just EMF. EMF of this battery. So now the uh, rule number two is if you travel from plus to minus across a battery, contribution to that equation, to the loop equation, is minus EMF of this battery. So these are two rules related to the battery. Now we need to develop a similar rules of, um, about resistors. So if we are going to cross a resistor, right? So what will be the contribution to our loop equation, right? And again, there will be two uh, rules about the, about the resistor, about a resistor, <clears throat> right? 
Okay, all right. Uh, so now uh, let's uh, move to a next slide about resistors, discussing resistors. Okay. All right. So now let's assume that this is there. this is a uh, resistor. All right. Okay, resistance is given. Usually you build the circuit, resistances are given, and of course, as I told you, we want to analyze it. We want to find current and then potential differences and so on. Right. Okay, <clears throat> again, every time before we start applying loop rule, we pick a travel direction. So let's assume that uh, we pick a direction and uh, it's uh, that way. That's our travel direction, again, which we need in order to know which point is final and which point is initial. Of course, in this case, this will be uh, initial point and this will be our final point, again, according to the travel direction. Okay, and at this point, when we discussed battery, a battery, we knew which point is at higher potential and which point is at the lower potential because we knew the properties of the battery, right? We saw that this electrode is positive, this electrode is negative. But now, can you tell or can we tell which point is at higher potential and which point is at lower potential, initial or final? And again, during the normal semesters, right, when we, uh, when we were in class, um, some students tried to give suggestions which points at higher potential and which point is at lower at the low is at lower potential but in this case actually we cannot tell right now because that information right now is absent it's not here right now we cannot tell and that's the major difference um, relative to the battery situation now we at this point we're kind of stuck so which point is at higher potential and which point is at lower potential? And uh, since that piece of information is missing, we need to use a trick, which we already used a couple of times in this semester. You remember we assumed a current direction. And you remember justification. Because we have 50% chances of getting right, uh, getting the 50% chances of getting uh, the right direction. It's either to the left or to the right, or clockwise or counterclockwise current, right? There are only two options. So if we assume a current direction, in this case, assume, just basically guess it. And with that assumption, write down all equations, solve the problem for currents, and if this current in your answer happens to be positive, then you can say, okay, I'm a lucky one. I managed to guess the correct direction. Just go and buy a lottery, right? Maybe it's your lucky day, right? But if your current at the end happens to be negative, what a big deal. You see the number of the current, the value of the current. Let's say you get minus five amps. So it means that this current, current through this battery, or through this resistor is 5 amps and minus in front just indicates that your original assumption about current direction was wrong. Flip it. Just make additional statements. So yeah, it means that minus means that um, direction of the current is opposite to what I assume. We are going to use this trick here all the time. And again, since we don't know the direction of the current, you just need to pick any direction. Don't sweat, don't think. Okay, and of course, don't tell anyone that I told you don't think. But in this case, it's true. Because circuits can be complicated. You can have multi-circuit, multi-loop uh, circuits, right? And uh, sort of to go to... Uh, guys, somebody's mic is on. Are you asking something? Okay, good. All right. Um, uh, what I was talking about. <laughs> um, yeah, so basically, uh, we just uh, need to... Uh, ah, yeah, uh, don't think, I told you. Right? <laughs> don't think. Uh, because, yeah, it's impossible to uh, see the direction, the correct direction of the current. Just assume any direction, clockwise, counterclockwise, stick with that direction, solve the problem, and then at the end, adjust it. All right? So pretty much don't sweat about both of these directions. Travel direction, any, clockwise, counterclockwise. Direction of the current, also any direction, All right? Okay, so uh, since we are at this point, so let's assume a current direction. 
Let's assume that in this case, current direction, I made this assumption that way, in the same direction as the travel direction. So I assumed this. Okay, now once I assume the current direction, now I can tell. So according to this assumption, this point must be at higher potential and this point must be at lower electric potential because you remember current according to our convention flows all, all the time from plus to minus from region uh, points with high electric potential to the points with lower electric potential you remember a couple of lectures ago we discussed current direction yeah so once you know uh, current direction you can say that of course this point is at higher v and these points are at lower v so our final point will be at the lower potential, electric potential, than our initial point, right? So now we have the whole picture. Now let's write down delta V because that's the goal. That's what we want to get. So delta V, uh, of course, it's a V final minus V initial. Again, this is final, you see, and that is initial point, right? And again, you see, uh, final point is at lower potential, initial point is at higher potential. So I can write V plus minus V minus. Again, minus it means lower, plus means higher potential. As a result, contribution to our equation, of course, will be obviously negative because you subtract larger number from the smaller number. And so how can we write the absolute value of this contribution? Usually resistance is given, right? You build the circuit, you know all these resistors. And the goal, our goal all the time, okay, most of the time, is to find the electric current. So the contribution, the voltage, uh, potential difference across the element is IR according to the Ohm's law, right? So delta V will be equal in this case minus IR, right? Again, R is given usually and current is our unknown which we will have to find. So rule number three mnemonic rule number three related to the uh to a resistor if both current or i mean both directions direction of the current and direction of the travel the same both directions are the same then contribution to the loop equation is minus i r so that is rule number three and the last one, of course, you can guess immediately. Of course, if directions are going to be opposite, direction of the current and direction of the travel, of course, contribution to the equation is going to be plus I R. Of course, I'm not going to discuss it as, <clears throat> as deep as I just did it, right? Because you just need to repeat uh, all that again. But of course, now directions are opposite, right? So this is, uh, again, final point. This is initial point, right? And direction of the current is opposite. So this point is at higher potential. That point is at, is at the lower potential, right? So <clears throat> you will end up in this case with V plus minus V minus, which is positive plus IR, right? Okay, so these are four mnemonic rules. Of course, of course, you can say, you know what, I hate your rules, they're stupid and so on, right? Come on, yeah, you can, you can do that, right? You can, you can, for example, instead of using these rules, you can apply all these logics uh, over and over again um, <clears throat> about each element, about each loop. But trust me, after a couple of examples, after a couple of problems, since it's so tedious, it's straightforward, but so tedious, and you have to be uh, careful about all these points, final, initial, higher potential, low potential, right? It will drive you crazy, right? After a couple of examples, you, I'm sure that you will develop your own rules, mnemonic rules. They might be slightly different, but they will be similar to these rules, right? You can develop your own rules. Do it, right? As long as it works, right? Or you can run this analysis over and over again, but of course, in that case, uh, writing equations will be so annoying, so compli no, not complicated, right? It will be very, very tedious, right? And sooner or later, you will, you will develop something else maybe, but similar to these rules. But of course, it's better just to remember them. And after that, once you, uh, get, once you get used to this these rules, writing equations, loop equation, it's sort of like this. It's, Mechanical, basically. <clears throat> right? Okay, so these are rules. Uh, and uh, now uh, let's look at the example. So what about time? Okay, we still have 10 minutes. Right. 
So first one, I will use uh, just a slide and then a uh, two loop uh, situation I will uh, discuss on a whiteboard, right? So first let's discuss uh, one loop circuit. You see we have two batteries, EMF1 and EMF2, 6 volt, 9 volts, uh, R1 and R2 values are given, but I will pretend that I don't know those numbers, right? I'm not going to use numbers. And so what um, our rules are universal, you remember, because behind them, what conservation of charge and conservation of energy, you can, you can apply them anywhere you want. So I want to apply those rules for this circuit to find basically current, current uh, uh, and potential differences across these um, resistors. And of course, we have two rules, junction rule and the loop rule. Junction rule, what can you say about junction rule? First of all, do we have any junction points in this loop? No, there are no any junction points. Corners are not junction points. I've seen in the past some students uh, try to treat corners, these corners as uh, junction points. No, at these points, currents, uh, current is, uh, doesn't get split and currents uh, don't merge. Right. No, it's just we need to create corners somewhere in order to have a loop, right? So <laughs> that's the logic behind those corners, right? So in this loop, we don't have any junction points. So the rule number one is not applicable over here. We can cross it out immediately. So, but loop rule, yes, we have to apply it. <clears throat> right. Okay, so now in order to apply loop rule, you remember, first of all, we need to pick those directions. We have to make a few preliminary steps. In this case, two preliminary steps before we start writing that loop equation. First one, uh, let's uh, assume direction of the current. Actually, of course, you can see what will be the correct direction of the current in this loop. Since this battery is stronger than that, of course, current is going to flow in a counterclockwise direction. But let's pretend that I don't know that, right? Okay, I assume uh, direction of the current uh, clockwise, all right. Okay, so let's assume that that's, uh, this is my assumption about the current direction. Of course, you know at the end, of course, I will end up, if I calculate numbers, uh, the value of the current, I will end up with negative value, right? Okay, so that's the first, we need to pick uh, a current direction and then the second step, preliminary step before we start writing down the equation, we need to choose a travel direction so we would know which point is final and which point points final and which points are initial, right? So again, you pick any direction you want. I pick uh, in, in the clockwise direction, right? So this travel direction, right? Okay, now and after this, I can pick uh, a starting point and start counting all the potential differences, right? And usually I start moving, uh, I pick the point so I can cross the battery first. I know my minor compulsion, right? I like to see EMF at the beginning of the equation, right? Okay, so I started with this point, you see, this corner. So according to the travel direction, you see, uh, I have to cross this battery first. And you see, we're crossing from minus to plus. It's a rule number one, right? In your notes, you can look rule number one uh, when we discuss the battery. If you travel from minus to plus, contribution to the loop equation is positive. Plus, in this case, EMF one. So we can write the first term in our loop equation, plus EMF one. Okay, so now after the battery, we go uh, across this resistor. Okay, guys, <clears throat> uh, one common point for confusion confusion. When we analyze a battery, we need to know only a travel direction. We don't need to know current direction, all right? But when you analyze a resistor, of course, you need to know both directions, current and travel. Because very often, okay, not very often, sometimes I saw students in the past, they got confused, they still use current direction to analyze a battery. No, in order to analyze the contribution to the loop equation from the battery, you need to know only the travel direction. You need just to, you just need to remember that, right? <clears throat> okay, so now after this, uh, we go across that battery, and, oh, resistor, and uh, through that resistor, current direction that way, travel direction also that way. So directions are the same. 
So it means that we can use rule number three, right, which is related to the battery, or to the resistor, sorry. All right. So if directions are the same, contribution is negative. Minus I times the value of the resistor. In this case, minus I R1. So that's our contribution. Second term, minus I R1. Okay, after that, we go to the battery. And across that battery, we cross this battery from plus to minus. You see, travel direction is down. So from plus to minus. That is rule number two. If you travel across the battery from plus to minus, contribution is negative, right? Minus EMF. In that case, in this case, minus uh, EMF two, right? Again, you see, when we analyze the battery, we need to look only at the travel direction. Right? Okay, and after this, we have to cross this resistor, right? And in this resistor, uh, direction of the current that way, Direction of the travel also that way, so directions are the same, so it means that contribution must be negative. Minus I R2 now. Minus I R2. And after this, we're getting to the initial point. We close the loop. Now, write down zero. We have to write down zero, right? Okay, this is, I don't know, maybe like... 70% of students, if I give a problem like this on the quiz, on, on the exam, they will just write down a bunch of these terms, but without equal to zero. It must be an equation. It's an equation, right? And for science majors, of course, we need to um, see the difference between the equation and bunch of terms, right? Without zero, it looks like a beheaded equation, basically, right? So add zero. It must be equal to zero. <clears throat> right. Okay, so that's the equation. And how many unknowns? Current. The rest, uh, the rest is given, right? So we can easily solve it for the current, move uh, terms to other sides, right? And you will end up with uh, what? EMF minus EMF2 divided by the R1 plus R2. So th th that's the value of the current. And of course, if you plug numbers, since EMF2 is larger than EMF1, of course, this, my current is going to be negative. And again, what does it mean negative in this case? It means that I choose the wrong direction for the current. Right? I assumed a wrong direction of the current. And then if you want to know the potential difference across uh, the resistors, okay, now it's a piece of cake. We, found, we just now found the current I. You know the resistance. Potential difference is just IR. Right, so you can find the potential uh, voltage drop across the resistor of one, IR1, I is this, right? And then the same uh, about the potential diff poten voltage drop across the second resistor, right? IR2, right? Okay, so basically at this point you can say, yeah, we've finished analyzing this circuit. Right. Okay, so that's application of this rule uh, to... Uh, single uh, loop circuit or circuit with one loop now let's look at a uh, two loop circuit probably we wouldn't be able to finish it it's like i think in the previous semester okay let me uh switch to the whiteboard uh these all these slides i posted uh last night uh in the blackboard so you you could see them okay so now let me uh, Switch to the whiteboard. Now you see we have more complicated uh, circuit, uh, which consists basically of two loops. We have two uh, batteries, EMF1, EMF2, and we have three resistors connected like this. And be careful, because right now these resistors are not connected in parallel neither in series, right? So a method of an equivalent resistance now cannot be applied here because of those batteries, right? Potential difference across this resistor is not equal to the potential difference across this and not equal to the potential difference across that. They look kind of parallel, but it's just a, from the point of view of art, right? Of point of view of drawing, but from the point of view of physics, they are not parallel to each other, right? Okay, yeah, so basically the class is over, but let me uh, say a few words. All right. So before we start writing down the equations, 
two equations. In this case, we have to apply junction uh, equation and loop equation. We, have to, we will have to make three preliminary steps. First, we need to identify all junction points. And of course, in this case, there will be two junction points, this and this, A and B. Then, second, we will have to start picking directions. Travel direction, car and direction. First, travel direction. Or maybe, you know, let's first uh, about car and direction. Uh, this junction point and this junction point, current changes only at junction points. Between junction points, current doesn't change. It means that between this point and this point, for example, in this branch, current doesn't change. We will pick a certain direction. We will pick a current through this because over here, current will be constant. So we will label it and pick a direction clockwise, counterclockwise, it doesn't matter. Then, of course, uh, between this point and this point, through this part of the circuit, again, current must be constant. We will introduce the second current. And then we will introduce current for this part of the circuit, for this branch between points, junction points. Again, we will introduce uh, the car current number three. So we'll have three currents, three unknowns, which we will have to find eventually. And then after introducing currents and their directions, we will introduce travel directions. We're going to use this loop and this loop. Again, travel directions, any clockwise, counterclockwise, it doesn't matter. It just change the signs uh, of each term next to each ter next to uh, terms in the equation. Instead of plus, you will have minus. Instead of minus, you will have plus if you pick a different travel direction. So what a big deal. Equation will be still basically the same. Right, so, and after picking uh, two directions for this loop and this loop, we will be ready to write, start writing down equation, loop equation, and of course, uh, and of course, junction uh, equation, right? Okay, so we will uh, finish that next class. It would take us probably 10 minutes. Right? Okay, guys, uh, so thank you. Uh, if you have questions, you can ask. Otherwise, I will see you tomorrow, some of you tomorrow and most of you on Thursday.